We're in the book of Acts. We're looking at themes from the book of Acts, and this is part 14. Part 14, and today is our third look at the life of the Apostle Paul, whose story dominates the latter half of Acts, beginning in chapter 9. And I've sought to give you some memory tools to bring to mind what Scripture teaches us about this man who began as Saul and then became Paul, and who experienced such a cataclysmic life change. So we have four points for Paul before he was a Christian, before he encountered Christ, and, uh, and then four points to describe him after his encounter with Christ, all using the names or his name. Uh, before he was a Christian, he was a persecutor, he was antagonistic, he was an unbeliever, and he was learned. We introduced you last time to the transformed Paul, whose life and ministry can be remembered by these four terms. Say them with me. Preacher, apostle, uncompromising, and loving. Very good. And I hope today to unpack that in a helpful and encouraging way. A little phrase I hear uh, fairly often that is uh, presumed to contain great wisdom is that we are human beings, not human doings, right? Human beings, not human doings. This line is usually used to affirm that we are more than our jobs. We have a valid existence beyond those tasks that we happen to perform. But that idea can be stretched too far. When God made human beings, He told us that we are image bearers, but then He went very quickly to what we are to do. Tend the garden, fill the earth, uh, rule over the creation. When you ask me who I am, I, I cannot separate that from what I do. They are connected, aren't they? Last Sunday we saw how the man Saul became a new man. He was transformed into Paul, and when he, when he did everything changed in his life. After his encounter with Christ, he now had a new Lord. He now had a new life, but what else did he have? He had a new mission. He had a new power to fulfill that mission. He had a new fellowship in that work. He had a new message to proclaim, and he had a new enemy that he had to endure. Paul became a dynamo of evangelical doing. So even as we celebrated last time the new man that Paul became, today we celebrate the new mission, the new ministry that he lived out in his life. To organize our thoughts for today, I'm going to call again on our acrostic P-A-U-L. The first of those letters stands for Paul the preacher, and Paul was clearly that. Uh, it would not be accurate to say that he grew into this role, however. No, no, no. In Acts chapter 9, Saul is on the road to Damascus to persecute believers there when he meets Jesus, and he goes on into Damascus after he has that close encounter with Christ, and, and there in Damascus he encounters the man Ananias who came and prayed for him, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and here's what we read next, verse 20, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the Son of God. When did he do that? Immediately. This brother did not waste time. Our, uh, our P word could be not preacher but proclaimer, and what he proclaimed was the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is awesome. Awesome. And, and this is just uh, the first time, of course. We read many times in the book of Acts about Paul preaching and teaching and explaining with a focus on Jesus as Savior and Lord. In Acts 13, the church in Antioch can, uh, decides to send Paul and his buddy Barnabas as their first ever missionary team to go out and start churches. And how did they do that ministry of starting churches? Well, Acts 13.5 says they reached Salamis, uh, they began, Sol Salome, and they began to proclaim the Word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. From there we read uh, of this man Paul and his companions going from city to city declaring the message of Jesus Christ. He was a preacher, he was a teacher, he was an apologist, we read it in Acts, and then we see Paul's amazing letters, the gift that we have in the letters that he wrote, which we are blessed to have for our instruction. You note, uh, note for a minute with me how Paul did it, Acts 13 again, verse 14. 
going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they, they went into the synagogue and sat down. I love this story. <laughs> After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. I mean, this, this cracks me up. It's like they had no idea who was sitting in their midst and what they were getting into. Hey, you, you visitors here, uh, Paul and Barney, is it? Uh, you got anything you want to say to the group? <laughs> uh, Paul saw this as an open door. <laughs> and, and so he proceeded to go back to the Old Testament. He proceeded to go back to, to Moses and then to David. He spoke of the prophecies of a Messiah. And, and then he got to his main point, which is that Jesus is the promised one, and even though the Jewish people missed it and killed him, God raised him from the dead, and the conclusion comes in verse 38. Brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. This is how Paul taught the Jewish people. He would open the Word of God before them and show how Christ fulfilled the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament Scriptures. In chapter 17, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. So Luke writes that this was Paul's ministry and his model and his custom. A few verses later, same chapter in a different city now, the city of Berea, verse 10, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. The focus of Paul's preaching clearly was Jesus. The text of his preaching was the Old Testament Scriptures. Remember, Paul, as Saul, he was already a Bible scholar by training before he became a Christian preacher. This man knew the Word of God, but when he met Jesus, something happened. He came to see the Scriptures in a whole new light. The Scriptures did not change, of course, but the man did. Paul did. And so now everything made sense in a new and different way that pointed to Jesus as the center of the entire revelation of God. Before, he looked at the Old Testament and he saw a bunch of stories and he saw a bunch of rules, but now he sees a Redeemer and he sees a great salvation. And he burned for all the world to see it with him. So, the P of our acrostic reminds us that Paul became a great what? A great preacher. Closely related to that is the A, which stands for apostle. He was a preacher, and he was an apostle, and he would later, later write in Ephesians that the church of Jesus is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Paul's apostolic role includes, but is broader than, his role as a preacher. It pertains to his critical leadership in the church and among the churches. He is a church planting missionary. In the epistles, we encounter Paul as the authoritative voice of revelation for the early church, but in Acts, the focus is on his role as a church planter. He is sent out in Acts 13 by that church there in Antioch, and he goes to various cities. He starts preaching Jesus in the synagogues and in the marketplaces. He gathers a group of believers who respond to his message, and then he teaches them. He shows them the way. He builds them into a community. He develops some of them to be leaders and eventually he ordains those leaders, calls them elders for the church, before he heads out to another city to do the same thing. In Acts 14, we get a snapshot of his approach in a place called Derby. There in verse 21, they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So one more verse. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So there you go. 
This is Pauline church planting. Preach, teach, train leadership, pray, and then move on. You got that? <laughs> preach the word, teach the believers, train leaders, pray, and then move on. Let's sit on that element of training or appointing leaders for a few minutes. This was critical for the health and the spread of the church. Clearly, there was no internet in those days, no possibility of Paul becoming a televangelist with a worldwide ministry in that respect. If the church was to grow and to spread, the leadership had to be passed down, had to be passed along, and so it was. When Paul gave pastoral advice to his son in the faith, Timothy, here's one thing he said to him, 2 Timothy 2.22, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this is the principle of multiplication. If Jesus trains 12 men who train 12 men, each of them train 12 men, and then those guys go out and train 12 men, already you have how many leaders? Don't put it up yet. Can anybody do the math in their head? How many leaders do you have if 12 guys train 12 guys who train 12 guys? It's pretty astonishing, really. Go ahead. 12 times 12, 1,728. That is fabulous growth. Of course, <laughs> of course, it never works out that cleanly, does it? People fall away, some people die, people move, but the principle of what can happen through multiplication is undeniably powerful. The church planter focuses on developing then leaders, working himself out of a job so that he can do it again somewhere else if that is his calling as it was for Paul. So look with me at Acts chapter 20, where Paul speaks to the elders from Ephesus. These were the men he had appointed for the church in Ephesus, men who exhibited significant maturity, who, who led lives of consistent godliness, men that were able to teach and to govern the church there. We have men like that in our church, by the way. I just spent much of the weekend with them. Thank God for those brothers, because those kind of guys, they're not easy to find. They're not. Paul, Paul valued this office of elder and those who occupied it. He valued that greatly. Who does he call when he comes near to Ephesus? He calls the elders. And look at how he addresses them in verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, just another word for elder, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. These men, he says, they're the shepherds of God's flock. They're the caretakers of the most valuable thing on the earth. These men are important. Do you share Paul's outlook? Do you share his perspective concerning the elders of your church as genuine leaders, as, as brothers to be honored by word and deed and prayer? Do you appreciate their task? Do you appreciate their calling? It is a big, big deal who is at the leadership table for a local church. If a church fails to maintain purity of leadership, the whole flock then is exposed. So as an apostle, a focus of Paul, everywhere he went, was to establish godly, wise leaders in that place. Second focus of Paul as an apostle came to be the Gentile world. Paul was not a Gentile. Oh, well, Paul was as Jewish as you could possibly be. But the calling on his life was largely to open up the, the non-Jewish world to the gospel, to the church, to the kingdom of God. This is what Galatians 1.15 says, Before I was born, God chose me and called me by His marvelous grace. Then it pleased Him to reveal His Son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the what? To the Gentiles. That's you and me. These were not uh, God's people. For, they're, 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 these are the people that were not God's people for many generations. So this is huge. In Acts chapter 9, when God first spoke to Saul, he told Ananias that Saul was chosen to take his name to the Gentiles. 
This was not exclusively his calling. Paul did preach the gospel to Jewish people as well. I think he was far more comfortable doing that, but eventually God pushed him toward a greater focus on Gentiles. The transition in this happened in Acts chapter 13. Now, one confusing thing about Acts 13 is that the action in this chapter begins in a place called Antioch, and it ends in a place called Antioch, but they're two different places. Uh, the first is Syrian Antioch. I asked Alam Musa, who is Syrian this morning, if she was familiar with the city. It's still there. She hasn't been there, however. That's Syrian Antioch. The second one was Pisidian Antioch. Now, Syrian Antioch is much closer to Jerusalem, had a large population of Jews there at the time, some of whom had just fled Jerusalem during the persecution of Christians there. Pisidian Antioch, in what would be modern-day Turkey, was way west or way to the northeast of Syrian Antioch. It had, it had uh, a large... Jewish representation. In Acts 13, Paul leaves Syrian Antioch in verse 4, and in verse 14, he arrives in Pisidian Antioch, where he goes to the synagogue, and there he preaches Jesus. Acts 13 is the longest sermon we have in the book of Acts by Paul, and it stirred up the Jews of Antioch who came out in opposition to the gospel and in opposition to Paul. We read of that in chapter 13, verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So more and more, Paul was going to experience opposition from his own people, but acceptance mixed with opposition from the Gentiles. To this ministry of church planting among Gentiles, brother Paul was appointed by God. Thank God that he was. You and I are heirs of the gospel treasures this brother brought to the Gentile world. All right then, back to our acrostic. (laughs) The P stands for preacher, the A for apostle. Our next point is the U. Say it with me. He was uncompromising. Paul was not one to be halfway in. Not as a persecutor not as an apostle. We saw how he didn't need very long to warm up to Jesus. He went straight from being the leading hater (laughs) to being the leading promoter of the faith of Christ. And his uncompromising spirit can be seen as we look at the outward circumstances of trial and opposition and his inward disposition of boldness. Paul made enemies at an astonishing rate. And the last half of Acts is full of his suffering at the hands of those enemies. Haters, both Jewish and Gentile. In Acts 9, Ananias was told by God that Saul was going to suffer much for the name of Christ. And then right after we see that he had been a Christian, he'd been a Christian for about a day and a half before his former friends tried to kill him in Damascus. So his new friends evacuated to Jerusalem, evacuated Saul to Jerusalem, where he again got in trouble. Chapter 9, verse 28, Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to what? They tried to murder him. This is, this is real <laughs> opposition. This is much more serious than uh, the persecution of the raised eyebrow that you and I sometimes experience from coworkers and neighbors and family members, right? Nowadays, I mean, nowadays you may get fired for your biblical convictions, and I don't diminish. That's a big deal. 
You may get called names on, on Twitter. Uh, you may get kicked off of Twitter. Paul faced potential death, murder, twice in the first month of his Christian life. <laughs> you might expect that he would learn his lesson and tone it down a bit, but he never does that. That's why the book of Acts ends. Where is Paul at the end of the book of Acts? He's in Rome awaiting trial. He's like Jeremiah. Jeremiah, in his book, chapter 20, verse 9, said this, If I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in His name, His word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I cannot do it. May God give us a passion for His Word and His truth like that. Boldness, it gets you in hot water, but it also can make you effective in ministry. So Acts 20, verse 20, he said to those elders in Ephesus, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything profitable teaching you from house to house. Seven verses later, he said, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Paul was the incredible non-shrinking man. <laughs> the incredible non-shrinking man. You know what it means to shrink back from something in fear, right? Paul refused to do it even though the temptations to do so would have been great. And the temptation to pull punches as a preacher it's always there because you discover that God's whole counsel is not popular. Have you discovered that? Not everybody wants to hear from you. Proverbs 9 verse 7, he who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself. He who proves a wicked man gets insults for himself. You teach all of God's word and some there are who will hold you in scorn or worse. So there is a temptation to hold back. And we all must pray against that for ourselves and for our leaders. Now, I think you can relate to this temptation, can't you? You know how hard it is to admonish somebody, anybody, because people hate to be admonished. But Paul says this, Acts 20, verse 31, Night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So how'd you like this guy for your pastor? Paul, uh, you know, he had an advantage over the modern pastor. If, uh, if a Christian in Ephesus didn't like his invasive, pushy pastor, what could he do? He couldn't take off to the church down the road. That wasn't available to him. Today, if you get a little too challenged, if some preacher gets under your skin, you can just vamoose to another church. And some people will say, I want a church where I feel more comfortable. The truth is that God's whole counsel, constant admonition, everything profitable, it's not always comfortable, is it? Listen, we do well to be under and we do well to be offering a ministry marked by Biblical boldness. So let's finish looking at our acrostic, our L word, preacher, apostle, uncompromising, and then the last one is loving. Everybody's for this one. We all like this. Uh, some personality types, you know, are bold and fearless because they don't care about people and they don't care what people think of them. That wasn't Paul. He laid down his life, he traveled the world, he endured the beatings because he loved his Savior, and he loved his church, and he loved sinners. Look at what he says in Acts 20 one more time, speaking to those elders. You yourselves know how, from, how, from, how from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears with tears. I'm going to take that a little deeper and suggest that he served with love. That, that, I'm convinced that was the source of his tears. He cared about these people in Ephesus. His heart was moved by their needs. He loved them with tears and with teaching and with hard work. He wanted that kind of shepherding to continue in that church. So he said, 
in verse 31, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. That speaks about the passion that energized his labor. Paul wept as he admonished them. Why? Maybe a better question is, why do guys like me not weep more often? If you don't know what there is to weep over, you don't understand the gospel, not very well, there are eternal issues at stake in how you respond to the pastor's message. There are. When your teenagers go and sit under Taylor tonight, how they respond to the message, the gospel that he brings, has eternal consequences on the line. That's why in verses 21 and 24 of this chapter, when Paul tells how he preached the gospel, he uses this adjective, this modifier. He says, I preached solemnly. Solemnly. We who declare the word have a solemn and an awesome word to deliver. Eternity is on the line. That's why Richard Baxter said, nothing is more indecent than a dead preacher speaking to dead sinners the living truth of the living God. Paul preached so that everybody knew he meant and believed what he was saying to them. And so he preached because he so loved his Lord and he loved his word and he loved those people and he loved the sinners who desperately needed Jesus in their lives. But there was something Paul did not love, at least not to excess. Chapter 20, verse 24, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Read, read that again to yourself. There's a lot there. His calling from Jesus. The gospel is about grace. Then there's a suggestion that the servant of Christ, or to the servant of Christ, his own life was totally expendable. In Revelation 12, we read this amazing word about the saints of God who overcome the devil, and it says of them, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own life even when faced with death. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Paul shows us the way. So committed was he to the calling, to the ministry, that when pursuing it, put his life at risk, he did not hesitate. We aren't talking about, again, risking his, his job or risking his reputation. He lived as many have lived since, believing that faithfulness to this Jesus, <coughs> it could get you killed. But the calling, the fame of Jesus, the advance of the church, it was to him more precious than this earthly life. This was the way, this was the example of Paul, because as you know, this was the way, an example of his master, whose we are and whom we serve. So as we wrap up this three-week look at Paul, let's commit ourselves to his master, to his work, as we close by asking that the same spirit and commitment that changed and gripped Saul and Paul would change and grip you and me. So, Father, we think back to that word that we read last week that Paul uttered in Philippians about how you laid hold of him. 
And we invite you to lay hold of us today. I pray, Father, that some of the young men and women growing up among us today would be appointed by you for the privilege of being church planting missionaries. We pray that you would appoint some of us of all ages for the privilege of bearing up under opposition. Father, in five years, some of us here will have lost jobs because of our faithfulness to Christ. We can hope it doesn't get much worse in our country, but we know some of our brothers even today are facing the loss of much more than jobs. We pray, Father, that we would hold our own lives as our brother Paul did loosely, but hold very tightly the calling that you have sent our way to bear witness of the grace of Jesus to this generation. Speak to our hearts individually about what this means for us, about what it means to follow you as proclaimers of your truth, what it means to be or to support leaders in your church, what it means to be uncompromising with the truth in the face of much opposition and pressure, and what it means to love brothers and sisters and lost sinners, even to the point of weeping for their souls. God, visit us with loving tears and gospel zeal. We thank you for our brother Paul. We're convicted by his example. Thank you that behind him there is Jesus, who died that we might be forgiven our failures but whose dying is worth our living for everything his dying was worth us doing. God, we pray that we would live for him who died for us more faithfully from this day forward. We ask in Jesus' good name. Amen.